I'm uh, very uh, pleased uh, to introduce our panelists today. On uh, so we'll have a panel on the graduate school. So we have um, Professor Daniel Panario. So maybe Daniel, can you say hi so that uh, hi? <laughs> all right, all right. So we have uh, Professor Jason Nielsen, who is the graduate director in the School of Mathematics and Statistics. Hello, everyone. And uh, uh, we have uh, John Mark uh, Demare, who is uh, a PhD student uh, in uh, math and stats, and so he will offer a perspective of uh, a graduate student. Hello. All right. So I should. Um, so we will proceed in the following format. So uh, so first, uh, I will have uh, some uh, question questions to ask uh, our esteemed panelists. Uh, and uh, then uh, once I run out of questions, so we will open the floor to the students. And so please uh, feel free to ask uh, any question that's uh, on your mind. My first question is very basic. So why, uh, what's the point of doing graded school, right? So why, why go that path and uh, why all this extra hard work? So who would like to start? You don't want to point to someone? <laughs> okay, I'll point to you, Daniel. Right? So well, I should have stayed quiet. I think. <laughs> yeah. So this uh, this a uh, good question, right? <laughs> it's sort of the very first question, right? Why doing graduate studies? You know, um, I think I think there are several reasons, and people may have different, you know, reasons why doing it. Um, the, the most obvious one, you know, I think, is the job opportunities that they open for, for many places, uh, many sorts of industry, governments, and, and et cetera. Um, not in all the doors, but in some doors, it opens, you know, more possibilities to, to have some graduate study, maybe a master uh, uh, for industry, and maybe a PhD for a more research-oriented place. So. So I think that this is the most basic uh, first thing that it opens job opportunities to people. I think that also, you know, you, you, you may want to be challenged, you know, and, 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 you know, doing something that is likely to be hard. I mean, you, you may like to, to do that. You may want to know more about the topic. Maybe you like some area of, uh, of math or stats and you want to know more about that area because you took courses as well. This is so cool. I want to know more. So, you know, that's also another reason. Um, and yeah, I think those are kind of the, the first things that I, could, that I could think of, you know. Jason, would like to- For sure. To so I think uh, there's multiple reasons to do graduate studies. Clearly, if you want a life in academia and, and doing research, even commercially in, a, in an R&D department, uh, you basically have to go to grad school. But I think progressively society is changing and there's a lot of professions, jobs that if you don't go on to do a master's degree, you probably won't even be considered, um, you know, even not necessarily stats can because they also have their own, um, you know, adjudication process and testing process that if you can pass some of their exams, um, they'll, you can, you can get in there. But but, um, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. Um, but yeah, uh, particularly in statistics, if you want a job as a statistician, doing a course-based master's is probably the lowest bar for which uh, you will actually seriously be considered. Um, but, and of, of course, following up with Daniel, it's good to learn new things, et cetera. I, I would encourage any strong students particularly in quantitative fields, mathematics, statistics, wherever, to, to do a master's degree. It's a one to two year commitment um, and it will improve uh, your higher ability, if that's a word. Um, and so I guess that's what I'd say about that. Thank you, Jason. 
John Mark, so what what is it for you? Sorry, right? yeah, so so I, have, I have a perspective on this. Um, I've started a master's degree twice and finished once. So uh, my undergraduate, I did computer engineering at uh, University of Ottawa. And then I started a master's directly from there. Um, so getting in contact with professors and so forth, and then starting the master's. But we didn't really have a clear idea on what the thesis would be. Uh, and I was in a thesis option. So kind of that drifted off near the end. And I did, I was able to use even, even the course section of a thesis based masters, I used to leverage myself into a position doing building cryptographic systems and so forth with, uh, with a very large company. Um, then I, I leveraged that uh, into them paying for my master's degree if I wanted to go back and study more cryptography. So it's definitely for job opportunities. That was uh, my, uh, my key uh, reason for doing it originally was um, I moved to the top of where I could with my just my undergraduate. I was a senior system developer. Uh, I still am actually. Um, but with the master's, I'm moving more into a subject matter expert, which is uh, another promotion on top of senior systems. Um, apart from that, also personal challenges, personal growth for myself. I wanted to know more about cryptography. I wanted to know more about code-based cryptography specifically at, at the time I did my master's. Now I'm looking at all the post-quantum kind of uh, areas of cryptography, but uh, at that time it was just, okay, I'm working crypto systems. This post-quantum stuff is coming out. I definitely want to be on top of that when it, when it starts to happen and it's starting to happen kind of later this year, early next year is when the big changes in the systems are going to be required for that. Um, so it was definitely a personal challenge saying fully employed, full-time employed, full-time master's degree, finish that last, uh, not this, this last August, but the August before that. Um, and I, and now I'm a PhD, still full-time employed, still a uh, full-time student. And it's, uh, very <laughs> personal challenges. It keeps it interesting for sure. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so that was my, uh, yeah, that's my perfect one. Yeah, very good. Okay, so uh, John Mark, so may I follow up with you? So let's move to our Absolutely. second question. So so you already mentioned what um, was the path for you to, mm -hmm. to graduate school, right? Uh, so do you have um, any advice for current undergraduate students, right? So how yeah. to like, follow this trajectory, right? So how to shape the trajectory into graduate school? Um, yes, my current advice for undergrad students is to um, get close to professors, be recognizable, have, be recognized as someone who does good work in their class. That will give you, at least when you're applying for graduate school, you need two references from your, from uh, professors. So. You need that, you need to, some professor to know your face, know your name, and uh, be able to sign off saying, yes, this would be a good candidate for graduate school. Uh, then um, in the application process, what I did for, because I was changing programs entirely, I was going from engineering to math, I needed to find an advisor. Uh, and to do that, I basically sent out a blanket email to everyone at Carleton who was doing research in post-quantum, Daniel was nice enough to answer. I got a few other answers. We did some interviews and uh, me and Daniel converged on what a thesis idea could be. And uh, we kind of went from there. So um, you get to know your professors, get to know, send out emails of introduction to people who do research in your area, try and find an advisor. And once you have an advisor, you're pretty much, you're pretty much golden. As long as your marks are there, you've got your two letters of reference and you have an advisor, you can, you can basically, you're in. Uh, the other problem I had though, the originally, because I'm working full-time, uh, I applied as a part-time uh, student and that did not go so well. That did not proceed past anything. So if you apply for part-time, they might not even look at your uh, application. They're going to look at the applications of the full-time students first. And then after those are filled, they might look at the part-time after that. I recommend applying as full-time. So now, thank you, John, John Mark. So now let us ask uh, the professors here. So, so maybe, so what advice uh, do they have uh, for, 
or undergraduate students uh, on the trajectory to graduate school. And maybe uh, they will share their personal uh, uh, history, right? So how did they get into graduate school? So Jason, so would you sure. like to say something? Sure, so I, I will say that uh, a career in academics was not one that I thought about uh, really seriously when I was an undergrad student. So maybe I'm coming from a different, uh, different uh, look at things. Um, but I've always been very curious and not, not really motivated by money, which is why I ended up in academia, but uh, joking. <laughs> um, but I was working, I, I graduated and I had a pretty decent job, but it was just mind numbingly boring. And so I applied to grad schools and realized that you could get funded to enhance your education. And I jumped on it. Also, it allowed me the opportunity to get out of, uh, to travel to a new place, uh, meet new people. Uh, but in terms of, of what you should do in terms of trying to uh, apply um, for grad school, I would uh, follow up with Jean-Marc, get to know your professors. Of course, you know, keep your academic uh, standards high because otherwise uh, you, you probably won't even be considering it. I can, I recognize some of the names here so I can see that, that, that that's probably not a problem. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, but of course for a master's degree, uh, particularly now, um, in quantitative fields, I, I don't see any downside to doing a, a, a master's degree, even course base to get out there. It'll just uh, boost your employability. And I think it's pretty important. Thank you, Jason. So Daniel, did you want to add something to this? Um, yeah, so the, the, the first thing in terms of general path is, uh, you know, you, you, you need to have good grades. That's absolutely fundamental. Um, you know, to have chances, you know, um, to enter in, in a graduate program anywhere. Um, so this is this has to be a concern when you're in the undergraduate level, when you're thinking on going into a graduate level. Now, why going into the graduate level? Maybe there is some, you know, done some things that you you really like the discovery side. You you do you took a course that asked you to do a presentation, a project, and a presentation, and you realize that you like it that and and that may take you into, the, into a graduate program. I'm thinking now, not job oriented, but just a graduate program, maybe in pure mathematics, let's say, or in pure statistics, let's say. Um, so, you know, you need to like the discovery side of things, you know, why, why, why is it so nice to, to find some ways of solving an issue, building this puzzle that you have little pieces and in the end you have an answer to that question, right? So you need to enjoy the things. Uh, so I would say those two things. Um, that, those in general, in the in the question of, uh, Yuli was asking about our past, my past was really uh, like the Beatles, you know, a, a wind the long and winding road, you know. So uh, yeah, so something like that. I I really uh, so, but it's a different reality than Canada 2021. So in you know, it's, it's a longer story. I can I can I have no problem in telling it, but I mean it's a. I come from a, from a different country. There was a different reality. Uh, and so I did my undergraduate and then I need to decide what to do. And then I thought, I, you know, maybe I can do this, maybe not. So I decided to go for a master in another country. And then from there, it was clear that, yes, I like to do the thing. And so I went for a PhD in the third one, that is Canada. And eventually uh, I stay here. So it was how, <laughs> how, how I managed my way was you know, a long way. <laughs> well, so you, you mentioned that at first you didn't know that, um, that you are good enough to do graduate school, right? So, so how did you know? And uh, what, what's uh, kind of the advice to undergraduate students? So how to know in general whether you are good enough to do grad school or, uh, or not? Mm. Me? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so, so here, here is, you know, either you ask it yourself that question or you didn't. <laughs> so if you didn't, yeah, fine, you don't understand this. Now, if you, if you ask your, that question, uh, uh, and there are a lot of people that have asked that question, uh, you know, um, you, you essentially uh, don't know. 
the 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 the, the blatant uh, frank you know answer is you do not know until you go and do it and then you say yep i can do this or nah you know what that was good for a master i'm out of here you know i don't really want to spend my life thinking in the things so i'm out or not or you say no this is really what i want to do with my life and then you stay so you know it's there is no simple answer. I don't think you know this. And if you ask it this question, you need to go through. And after you go through, you say, you know, this way or that way, find, find both ways, whatever way, whatever suits you, right? So, so in my case it was like that, but it was kind of, the, the environment was not helping me to know. So I definitely need to ask that question. So, so I, I, I decided to, to go to Brazil and, and do my master there and so on. So, you know, it was, a, you know, it was my path in that way. Thank you, Daniel. So Jason, what, what's your advice? So I think I can talk about myself personally, but I, I don't think I will. I, I'll say particularly if you're studying statistics, um, doing a course-based master's is just extending your undergrad a little bit, the courses will be harder, you'll get the better training that you need to be properly ready for the type of employment that you're going to face in, in a statistical, you know, data science, slash analytics, whatever terminology you want to use for these quantitative type jobs. Um, but if you're really keen on mathematics, statistics and research, maybe thesis based, then I agree with Daniel, you just have to give it a shot and go and you'll find out not necessarily whether you have the ability because I think a lot of people have the ability but I think yeah. you also need the passion because there's a lot of self-motivation that goes on uh, in that path you know towards you know getting your master's thesis and then going on and doing a PhD and you're going to hit some hard hard walls that you'll have to sort of climb over and if you don't have that drive and passion for it you probably won't make it and it's probably not going to work and you'll, you'll definitely find that out when you're a master's student either doing a project or a thesis i would i would say mm -hmm. john mark john mark so what what's your perspective on this uh, i'm still asking myself the same question <laughs> <laughs> uh, if i started a master's again i'd be asking about my master's again <laughs> so, um I, it's Basically, there, there's an imposter syndrome, and, and it happens in school, it happens in work, it's always, am I good enough to do this? It, it happens to me, no matter what I'm doing, and uh, as I take on bigger and bigger tasks, it, it's always the same question, but uh, it kind of, you can take that question and use it to drive, okay, let's say you're only 80% good enough, well, that drive has to come from you then, you have to provide that 20% extra in everything you do. And it it allows you to excel if you if you treat that question properly. That's that's the perspective. Thank you, Jenna. Right. And if um, you would allow to for me to add uh, like uh, two cents to, to this, so right. So for Carleton students, uh, so we have uh, some research programs, and I think this is uh, also an excellent place uh, how to test yourself and see if you can uh, succeed in the research environment or not. And uh, from what I see, most people uh, actually do well. So, so it's natural to question yourself whether you're good enough or not. But uh, I would say uh, most people succeed uh, in, in graded studies. So if you are asking this question, so my advice, go for it. All right. Um, now, an important technical question. So that will uh, determine the future of a graduate student. So how to select a research supervisor, All right? Uh, so, um, so, so Daniel, maybe if you could start on this. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So how to select a supervisor? So the, the first thing to know that the students may not know is that this is actually quite crucial step because um, not only, okay, so here there is, depends on program because if you're doing a master courses, doesn't matter at all. But if you're doing a, a, a master 
with a thesis start being important. If you're doing a PhD, it's crucial because you know you will spend four years more or less, uh, you know, studying this problem with this supervisor. So you better <laughs> sort of uh, you know uh, like the person, you know. So that uh, you know, so that's that's one thing. Um, how to choose it? I I think in most people just take courses. So if you're in Calton and you know the professor, just take courses with professor. Take courses with as many professors, different professors as you can, and you will see that you know. Oh, I yeah, I like many things, but I really like this topic with this person. And then you know, people are very accessible in Calton, so it's very easy to knock at the door. But in 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 no, in, in not pandemic times, but I mean, send an email and. Uh, and it's, it, people are very accessible. So most likely people will be happy to, to, to talk with you and give you some hints of this or that, what you need for applying this or that. So if you're applying in Calton, then it's easy because you can really have access to the person. You can take the courses, see what you like, what area you like, what general area of math stats you like, because there are several corners in both sides. So what is that you really prefer? And then among them, there are this professor, which is the, the one that I feel better because I took the course, I like it, how, whatever, right? Whatever reason, that's the person. So that's, that's I think, the way. Now, the problem when you are choosing in somewhere else, some other place that, that may happen that you apply somewhere else, is that you need to just go for what you see in the web. And, and that really is not the whole picture, right? It's part of the picture. You see the paper, you see the article, where it published, the type of things it, this, this researcher does. So, but, uh, you know, it's not the whole picture. You don't know if it will be a good person. I want to just say one more thing. That is why it's so crucial, this thing here, because the part of the funding, I, I, you know, of course, Jason is the person to talk about this, but part of the funding is attached to the supervisor. The supervisor will put, from, from, from her, her, her or his grants, will put, you know, a part of, the amount, the funding, the, the general funding that come to the person. So it is, you know, uh, part of the funding also will be attached. And if you want to change supervisor, there may be issues there because the person, there is a funding attached. This is not true in all the places, but in Canada, in most places, it is the case. So, so that's kind of something that also has an extra issue that you need to think, especially for PhD, for master is one year, but for PhD, uh, you know, it, it is more crucial, you know. Thank you, Dan. So, Jason, like what, what's your view on this? So, I, I would agree. I mean, supervisor is incredibly important when you're seriously considering uh, any res research component of the master's program. It, it, for, I'll just say this straight out, for um, the course-based, you're going to essentially be assigned a, a program advisor and you'll meet with them and they'll help you select courses, et cetera. So it's not, it's not that big of a deal. Uh, they're there to sort of help you and give you guidance on which courses to take, et cetera. Um, I would say, however, that uh, supervisor choice is, is much, much more important at the PhD level. And I, I think we're talking to undergrads. So for master's students, if you, you know, if you're a Carlton student coming to Carlton, Daniel's advice is great. You, you'll have get to, you, you, Get to know people, your professors. You'll, you know, have taken courses. You'll certain topics you'll find really fascinating. You'll have a rapport with certain professors, and then it's an obvious choice. You should put that person down um, as your choice when you apply. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're applying elsewhere, I wouldn't do that uh, simply because it actually might limit your your chances of being admitted. Um, because if you say this is the person I want to work with and they don't want to work with you necessarily or for whatever reason, whatever reason that happens that they don't say that they're going to step up, it actually, that doesn't help you that much. So um, what you should choose is the person whose research lines up with the things that you at the, the time of application think are the things that you're really keen on and excited about. So that's what I'd say. So, John Mark, you obviously have chosen your supervisor very well. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so my method was, yes, I'm applying from a different undergraduate and I'm applying to 
a program I don't know at a school I don't know. And my my uh, my method of selection was to look at the web page, uh, see who has uh, interests aligning in the area of well, it was code based cryptography I wanted, so code theory and on the field and so forth. Uh, email them all, see who I can get an interview with, if anyone. Um, I was lucky enough to uh, get interview with Daniel and uh, we, we hit it off. We had some of my research ideas right away and uh, worked from there. Um, that was for master's degree, but uh, it's good advice when you're doing the master's degree, have a good, yeah, as people are saying, have a great idea of what you want your thesis to look like when you start. And from there, it'll be easier to select an advisor uh, someone who can help you get to that final picture. And you can look at who, who does research in that area, select your people properly, send them the ideas of what you want your thesis to be. And uh, you'll have, a, I think, greater success in finding someone. Just if you know what you want from the master's degree going in, what do you want your thesis to look like? Select an advisor to that will help you build that as opposed to just applying for a degree like you would an undergraduate degree. Thank you, Jeremy. All right, so the last question uh, I have is about uh, dollars and cents, right? So how does uh, graduate funding work, right? And so maybe uh, the most in person, kind of uh, relevant person to answer this question is uh, our graduate director, Jason Nielsen. So, sure, Jason. no problem. So. Um, well, this is for undergrad students, so I'll talk about applying to a master's degree. Um, and it, the funding picture generally depends on whether you're permanent resident, Canadian citizen, or an international student. There's actually have been, in recent years, some interesting new uh, programs that have helped international PhD students, but they generally don't apply um, directly for master's students. Um, but if you're a, a permanent resident or a Canadian citizen when you apply um, and you're accepted, you almost most almost certainly be offered a, a TA ship, um, which is around $11,000 a year. Uh, you'll be offered an entrance scholarship if your GPA is past a certain threshold, which I believe currently is 10, 10.5. I'd have to double check that. Um, as well as a departmental scholarship that for master students is around uh, two to three thousand uh, dollars per year for the two years of the, of the program or the two years allocated for the program. You can certainly finish earlier if you wish. Um, so that's the type of funding that you would be offered on entry. There's also RAs. I don't think I'll, I'll go into What's that too RA? much. A research assistantship. Sorry about that. Thank you, Yuli. So, and a TA is a teaching assistantship. Um, so part of your, you, you would be paid to go in and do tutorials, run labs, etc. cetera. Um, and it's at maximum, it's 10 hours a week for 13 weeks. And are there, sources of funding that are external to, to Carlton? There, there certainly are. So I was going to jump into that. So there's outside of that, there's funding that you get when you apply or offered when you apply. And then there's also different types of funding. We'll start with the external. There's uh, big ones such as NSERC and OGS. So National Science and Engineering Research Council of Canada. Um, and actually those deadlines I think for the upcoming year have already passed, definitely for the OGS. And I think NSERC is December one. So if you haven't started uh, for NSERC, uh, that's probably be a bit of a bit of a stretch, uh, but you should definitely apply for these. So the, um, N the NSERC is around 17,300, I think right now, that's for your standard uh, masters. Um, and it's good for the two years. Uh, it's a more prestigious award. It's a little bit more difficult to get. Um, you also have to be a Canadian citizen or a permanent resident. And then you have the OGS, so the o Ontario Graduate Scholarships. And here, actually, you, you do not have to be a Canadian citizen or permanent resident. You just have to be a student who's been accepted and is in good standing at an Ontario university. Uh, and those awards are easier to get uh, than the NSERC, and they're $15,000 a year. And, but you have to apply yearly. It's not uh, something that uh, will 
follow you through 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 the program. Um, there are also internal awards. So some of these are are academic merit based, and some are financial. These there's endowments, etc. And you should apply for them if you you qualify. When once you're a student and you're accepted and you're in the program, you can go into Carlton Central and look at all the different endowments that are there. Uh, the, the, the the amounts range from five hundred dollars up to a, a fair amount. Uh, particularly some of the ones that are financial need. Um, there's so many of them that I I actually can't break them down. Um, but certainly, um, you should definitely look into them. There's descriptions in Carlton Central, and you have to decide whether you know you are are eligible or not uh, to apply. But certainly, the, so there's there's plenty of uh, plenty of uh, scope there for for funding. Thank you, Jason. I, I'm certainly happy to answer questions. So there's right. so many different aspects of this, but that's kind of the the general layout. Good. Um, Daniel or John Mark, did, did you have something to add uh, to? No, <laughs> he, he, Jason already explained everything. So no. Okay. You can also get an employer that pays part of your tuition if you can. Oh, yeah, John Mark. So, so tell us about this. How common is this? And um, so, and, how common and, is it? I'm not sure, but uh, I looked um, before, before I started. I uh, looked at my employee benefits package at work and it was $6,000 a year towards any uh, degrees or certificates or anything you want. So basically they, they have at work something to keep up. I guess in, in an engineering position, uh, it's more important. If you're a professional engineer, you need to prove that you are continually learning and, ed and educating yourself. So they do have a, a $6,000 uh, from work that they put aside to give anyone to uh, to advance their own knowledge certificates. And that, does it mean that you have to stay as a part-time employee during your graduate studies? I'm a full-time employee, so. <laughs> oh, so you're a full-time employee and a full-time PhD student? Yes. How is this possible? It is challenging. <laughs> well, I'd say it's more than challenging. <laughs> Um, wow, I'm, I'm so impressed, yeah. so impressed, right. A day with 48 hours, make it. Yeah. <laughs> I do, um, yeah. Yeah, it's even, it's very handy that we're in COVID times and I don't have to commute anywhere. Um, so, so I can sign Please. off for an hour from work, go to a lecture, sign back on to work an hour later, oh. uh, go to the next meeting and so forth, so. <laughs> I do take wow. advantage of that a lot. Um, wow. I should Get actually, I, yes, I should, please. I should actually jump in. I'm uh, something that uh, Jean Marc said uh, earlier about part time, full time, mm -hmm. in terms of funding. As a part time student, you're not eligible for much of the entrance uh, of funding that I discussed, because it's it's based on uh, provincial funds allocated to the university, etc. So part time students, things like TA ships, etc., that you're not eligible for them. So. But uh, yeah, they might not even look at your application if you're applying for part-time either. So it's challenging to get in, to be a part-time student at all. Potentially, for sure, absolutely. I'm not yeah, yeah. questioning that. <laughs> However, yeah. I'm also saying that you will not be offered basically most of the funding, the, the funding that comes uh, with your mm -hmm. offer. And that's simply because TA ships only, yeah. the, the university will only transfer those funds to, for the TA ships for students that are uh, full time and enrolled in full full time, but uh, part time for course based students, I would say is is less difficult than oh for then. So if you're thinking about part time and you're looking at a course based program, I wouldn't scare people off. That is much more likely for an offer to be made if you're a student with a good GPA, etc. But for thesis and project you're correct because uh, you're now working with a faculty member who wants to move the research forward in, in, ex in a faster way, right? Yeah, that's a good point, right? Mm -hmm. So Daniel, did you want to add something? Yeah, just, just one thing. Um, Jason can correct this if he's wrong, but my impression is that, and this, I know that, that uh, you know, this is for undergraduate students that probably will be doing a master, but assuming that some of them may eventually go in for a PhD, 
my impression, and I think my knowledge, uh, in my case at least, Jason can correct if this is right or wrong, is that when you arrive to a PhD program, because you get TA chips and RA chips and etc., in general, it is uh, enough for living without any luxury, but enough for living. So uh, it was the case when I did my PhD in, in Toronto a few months ago. Uh, and I think it continued to be true in general across Canada that uh, you know if you, you can focus only on PhD, you will need to be TA, you will need to be marking things, you will need to be helping students you know, in the center that we have and so on. But still, for most people, it's enough to, to survive without, without any major problem or, you know, starting to have my depths and things like this. Jason can correct. For PhD, for master, I don't know. I don't think so, but I don't know. That is all, that would all line up with the RA. So the funding for a master's student without well, so if you're a course-based student, you would still qualify for TA ships, entrance scholarships, uh, and even a, a you know a, a departmental scholarship. And you know you add all that up, it's it's not in today's world. It's not enough to survive completely in 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 Ottawa and with inflation at like six percent or whatever it is right now. Who knows? Uh, but it's still it will cover all your tuition. And, you know, uh, but you're right. So at the PhD, I should also say you're unlikely to get any RA if you do a course base or it's pretty much guaranteed that you'll get no RA. So if you're, you know, um, I, again, I don't want to go too much into the RA because that's at the discretion of, of, of the faculty member in terms of how they go about dealing with that. Um, <clears throat> but I mean, we do have some guidelines about how, <laughs> how, to, how, to, how to deal with that. But as a PhD, most PhD students have, I would say, yes, I would agree with that, Daniel. They have, they make enough funds that they're living all right if they're single, uh, single. If yeah, they, no luxury, yeah, <laughs> for sure. No family, no kids. No family, family, no dependent. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. But uh, you wouldn't be living. Yeah, it's it's pretty decent. Mm -hmm. All right. So I want to thank everybody. Thank you for your time. And um, no, thank you for organizing these things. I mean, it's very very good. Right. All right. Have a good evening, everybody. All right. So thank it's you. Been, it's it, it's been an interesting experience. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good night, everyone. Bye bye. And good luck to our undergraduate students uh, getting into grad school. Mm. Yes. <laughs> you bet. <laughs>